It is March the 15th, 2022. I'm Chris, and this is Curiously Polar. Here we are. Second tr try is the charm. <laughs> We're recording. Second try is the charm. We, we had a bit of a false start. Who, who, who knows apart from us? So um, look who's on the screen. Or actually, if you listen to this podcast, who listen, listen to this faint voice there of the bearded Hello. man. <laughs> and, come back from Antarctica. Welcome back, Henry. <laughs> we missed you. Henry, I missed yes. you too, guys. Back, back on Earth, mm. so to speak. Back to civilization. <laughs> back to civilization, yeah. Back to civilization. <laughs> and uh, a, a little birdie told us that uh, you got married up there. Mm, you did. <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> I surprised my wife a little bit down there, yeah. <laughs> so you you brought your wife with you and uh, your future wife with you and you returned with a wife. Yeah, we had a wedding program um, pre-organized from the company I worked for. And in that capacity, we had a um, officiant from the British United Territory with us oh, wow. who was officially... Uh, marrying people. <laughs> yeah, there's the photo. And on the video, everyone is watching. And on the video, video, you can see <laughs> Mario just showing uh, a picture of that. Yeah, and um, with that, uh, because we had largely uh, U.S. Americans as guests, um, the U.S. would uh, acknowledge the U.K. Uh, marrying license, and um, that's what I thought would be a very easy way to bypass uh, Romanian laws, if you like. Last year, we tried to get married, and uh, we were lacking two papers. And um, when I heard about the officiant coming um, down to, to Antarctica, and after I uh, found a way to get my wife on board, um, working with me on the ship, um, I thought oh, it's a nice idea to actually surprise her getting married down there. So I brought her her wedding dress from the um, unofficial ceremony we had in May <laughs> last year. It was... Uh, yeah, hidden in my duffel bag under the bat for four months, and <laughs> so, <laughs> so a you, little creased. <laughs> so you, so so you got to you got married in Antarctica to circumvent German bureaucracy. That's quite a yes feat. G German and Romanian bureaucracy because we live in Romania <laughs> and we were lacking German papers. But yeah, so you went you went to, with a British official in British exactly. papers down in Antarctica. Well, it sounds almost like a joke. That's, and then we got actually okay. married in uh, Paradise Harbor, which is one of my most favorite spots uh, in Antarctica. And so now I can say I get married in Paradise, which is uh, entirely Fantastic. true. <laughs> so romantic. That is hopeless a, romantic. That is crazy. <laughs> that is really. Crazy. I just loved her face when 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 she lost it when she got uh, the the news of um, you're getting married now and she's like what no I'm not getting married. <laughs> <laughs> you come with me. You get married now. Here's your penguin. <laughs> there we go. Very good. Fantastic. Yes. So congratulations. Awesome. Thank congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. About today's show, we have um, a couple of items well a couple of few items we have the newsreel of course but this time we also have a main item which is the endurance has been found and uh, we'll get to this after the newsreel first piece of news um probably not a surprise for anyone listening we have a war in europe right now um russia invaded the ukraine um we're recording this on the 15th of march so that is like 20 years uh, 20 20 days hopefully not years, 20 days into this. And um, of course, that also has its influence on things that happen in the Arctic, because Russia is part of that. And uh, the Arctic Council sent out a tweet um, saying, the Arctic Council is pausing all official meetings of the Council and its subsidiary bodies until further notice. So um, that, I guess, has to do with the fact that Russia is chairing the Arctic Council. Right. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, it's not only that Russia is chairing the Arctic Council, but is one of the eight Arctic states, and decisions in the Arctic Council have to be taken unanimously. And uh, here we have obviously a uh, um, divergence of uh, interpretation or uh, or analysis of the situation. So seven Arctic states are saying that Russia invaded Ukraine, and uh, one Arctic nation is saying that Russia is uh, doing a a sort of a, a special military operation. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this uh, creates uh, tensions, or at least uh, creates uh, uh, the impossibility of finding a way forward. Um, and uh, 
for the month of March now, uh, we have here at the at the Arctic Council, as you can see, Arctic Council there, because I'm sitting at the in one of the offices in the space of the Secretariat of the Arctic Council here up in Tromsø. This is where the working group that I work for, AMAP, is uh, located. Um, we have uh, suspended all uh, public appearances uh, and. Um, and uh, and we're waiting awaiting further instructions hopefully we'll get uh, uh, to uh, go ahead to resume soon which would mean that uh, the situation the conflict has been resolved and uh, otherwise uh, probably we'll have to keep up uh, the work that we are doing in the background but this is not good for uh, climate uh, for example because uh, um, all of the attention is taken by the conflict and uh, nobody is uh, doing anything anymore about the climate and this I is think it's uh, it's not good for the entire arctic corporation as yeah. that it's also uh, kind of a precedence nothing mm. like that ever happened since the formation of the arctic council so it's very difficult right. for mm. the member states also to find a a, a way find a, a common base to mm. deal with a the situation there's nothing written down how to to work around that and Not only, but uh, what is written down is the decisions that will be taken unanimously. And yeah. uh, so if you don't have eight Arctic nations sitting at the same table and being unanimous, you cannot even change the rules of behavior of yeah. the organization. So this is actually quite, uh, quite anyway, a conundrum. This, but uh, hopefully this will be resolved soon. It's an unfolding situation and we'll certainly keep an eye on it because it, uh, it touches what we do here yeah. and what we are interested and, in. And to be and, fair, and, if, if we look at the map, Russia is covering fifty percent of the landmass in the Arctic, so it's a it's a, a big factor we're talking about right. here. Yeah, and uh, in any case, it's not for diminishing the importance of the of the situation for the for U Ukraine, and uh, and let's hope that the conflict is resolved uh, soon because that's of course uh, a very big uh, a big problem. But um, it does have its repercussions for the Arctic cooperation and for the for the climate and for the for the rest of the globe and for the future. All right, moving on for now, Argentina in their Antarctic endeavors um, is getting a new vessel. Icebreaker. Icebreaker. An icebreaker. Yeah, yeah. Oh, an icebreaker. <laughs> I, I, I do, for some reason, I yeah. do not connect Argentina with icebreakers. <laughs> no, but the, uh, of course, Argentina has uh, quite a lot of uh, claims for uh, Antarctica. And uh, until now, they have had uh, uh, like... Uh, the Almirante, Almirante Irizar, uh, which uh, which is a quite an, an old uh, an old icebreaker, and uh, it has to be <coughs> supplying thirteen bases, thirteen Argentinian bases in Antarctica. So right. they finally put an order in the Finnish yard, and uh, for uh, they will be getting a new um, a new icebreaker. So Almirante Irizar is is not only old; it also got uh, refurbished just recently. So it was out of service for quite a while, uh, quite a while now. So that makes it very difficult to supply the Argentine bases. Um, what happened now is that the uh, the Argentine um, or the Argentine um, Antarctic or Defense Ministry, I think it is, um, went to Aco Arctic, which is uh, a, a very well known address for. Um, ice strengthened vessels for icebreakers for supply vessels in um, in, in um, high duty or heavy duty environments and they designed the ship mm. and it's going to be built in Argentina if I understand that correctly in an Argentine shipyard and um, I hope it's going to um, support Amirante uh, uh, fairly soon it's, uh, it's good to have uh, those capacities down uh, around the peninsula mm. where most of the Argentine uh, bases are located. Yeah, and it's going to be a PC4 uh, ship, so it's... What does that stand a, for? Quite a sturdy. A La Pola class 4. So Pola uh, class quite 4. A, quite, a, quite a good icebreaker. <laughs> All right. 131 meters, yeah. Okay, let's stay in the Antarctic and uh, look at life there. What did scientists find? Mm-hmm. Well, the uh, I think that you're talking about the formation of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And uh, now if we right. talk about the different ice sheets that we have in Antarctica, uh, they have not, uh, well, one of the theories was that uh, uh, 35 million years ago, 
the Earth cooled, and at the same time, you have the separation of Antarctica from South America, and then you have a formation of uh, the uh, circumpolar current, and therefore isolation of Antarctica, and uh, freezing of the continent. That uh, we, I think we had talked before that there have been forests, and there have been uh, like a, almost a dinosaurs. Well, temperate dinosaurs in Antarctica. So there is something interesting. But now the scientists from Alfred Wegener Institute, of course, and um, they published uh, in um, in one of the Nature Journal's uh, communications, Earth and Environment, that the West Antarctic ice sheet, and I think that maybe in that site that you're looking now, you can see a figure of where the West Antarctic ice sheet is. Um, so on the little figure, it's the one that is on normal in the normal representation of Antarctica is on the on the left of the Antarctic Peninsula, is uh, uh, where you uh, probably had a uh, a warmer period than in the rest of the of the continent due to uh, due to uh, currents, and therefore the uh, persistence of uh, like more temperate uh, conditions and uh, the uh, continuation of uh, a land uh, colonization of plants and, and animals that uh, that uh, continued a few uh, thousands of years anyways. Yeah, it's interesting to see what, what the paper actually uh, unveiled um, during the research is that they went through uh, to, to Pine Island Glacier, which is one of the... Um, two big glaciers in the Western Arctic ice sheet, which are also the main factors for destabilization right now. Um, and they found evidence that ocean currents were still um, going on, while, or were already going on while um, Antarctica was cooling down. So it's a sign that the direct passage already opened at that time. So mm. it changed the understanding of that the Western Antarctic ice sheet has not formed at the same time as the Eastern Antarctic ice sheet, but later. And that's something completely new for uh, for scientific understanding to find evidence for that and uh, to see that there was a time when West Antarctica was much, much warmer than East Antarctica before then glaciation has uh, set in. That's pretty a pretty awesome um, find here. Yeah. yeah, and with say maybe one to two million years difference between, between the two areas and it's all looking at uh, the sediment and uh, yeah. the marine sediment and how uh, actually quite deep marine sediment but uh, very very interesting to be able to do this of course though uh, some of these are uh, uh, um, investigations that you do with uh, using air guns and making a lot of noise so let's hope that, uh, <laughs> that uh, this has also been taken care of uh, like looking at uh, not disturbing uh, marine life with too much noise all right. That's very interesting data. Another thing that gets disturbed is ice. We have um, something <laughs> here about the Larsen B embayment being in a bit of a bad yeah. situation. This is and this is actually quite uh, quite uh, quite an interesting thing. Now we're passing on the on the east of the Antarctic Peninsula and uh, towards the Weddell Sea and uh, we already mentioned that the uh, Larsen B or the Larsen ice shelf had take as that been destroyed. Uh, now the um, how do you call it the uh, shelf the ice shelf is uh, land ice that is sh gone into the sea and is floating onto the sea. When that's that's what this, glaciers push out into the sea yes. pretty much, and and therefore is uh, freshwater ice and it's uh, attached to the shore. And when it broke, it went out to sea and we created nice, nice big tabular icebergs. Then an embayment is when the sea actually freezes again and forms a new pack ice but uh, th that is attached to the shore, but it, this is marine ice. And uh, and this formed a few years ago, and uh, and, and it has, <laughs> a few years ago is, is nicely put. 2011. It's actually <laughs> quite it's, some time ago. <laughs> yeah, it's quite some time ago, but still, it's much less than the uh, than the um, 
than the uh, actual ice shelf. I mean, Certainly. the ice shelf is much, much older, was much older. And, and now when we say 2011 is uh, in, let's say, in, in glaciological times, it's not too long, I must, uh, I might argue. But That's very, this- very true. But in, in the history of the ice shelf, and you see how the disintegration of Larsen A and B mm. happened, um, seeing that uh, sea ice not only formed in the embayment of uh, Larsen B, but also stayed there stable for 10, 11 years. That's the, the, the special feature here we, we are looking at. So that's really yeah. something uh, astonishing. And it just... Uh- Crumbled away, and uh, it, and it looks the, very the dramatic. The of January, watching so. the video, this is, I mean, this is like, yeah, it's it's completely pulverized, yeah. pretty much. That's yeah, it, it just like. broke away in, in, a, in a few days. Yeah, in in a few yeah. days, yeah. this is January sixteenth, yes. where everything is coupled together, and this is ten days later, and it's just like like someone yeah. Yeah. exploded it. But this also supports um, the observations we had down um, in the area. And for me, it was this year the very first time to be able to go into the Weddell Sea with a, with a ship, which is ice strengthened, but is not really a uh, sophisticated um, it, one of the new Polar Class 6 vessels or anything. So we are um, in, a, in, a, in a very um, light ice environment, uh, usually where we're working. Um, so we're not going very deep into difficult terrain. Mm-hmm. And this time we actually managed to go down to um, James Ross Island, which would at the time where we traveled, usually be covered in a, a, with sea ice or surrounded by sea ice. And mm-hmm. um, we found that the sea ice situation this year was very, very um, different from, from other years. We had a lot of sea ice, um, which was breaking up um, south of the Le Maire Channel on the Western mm-hmm. Peninsula. But on the eastern side, there was pretty much ice-free. And um, that was something a lot of ships took advantage from. And then you could see um, the more sturdy ships, they went much, much further south. And then we had um, a French icebreaker who went down all the way to the last ice shelf and literally touched the ice shelf in oh, the wow. area where the embayment just broke apart a few days mm-hmm. later. So that's really mm-hmm. something... Uh, very um, yeah, recent for us um, just coming back from the area. Yeah. And actually, now that we're talking about it, we didn't make put it in the in in our in our plans. But uh, the Polar Star, the uh, U.S. icebreaker, had a record further south uh, of any ship ever, didn't they? Yes, yeah, hmm. a few days ago. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, a quite uh, quite an interesting. Quite an interesting uh, season, let's put it this way. <laughs> yeah, the, the weather was very, very uh, erratic. It was nothing you can really plan. It was much, much warmer than uh, previous seasons, and that's also something that um, yeah, pies into the embayment just breaking mm-hmm. off. Um, the uh, water temperature was um, significantly warmer than it used to be at that part of the year. So we have a couple of factors um, coming together here, and then mm-hmm. um, the sea ice that formed and stayed for 10 years just uh, broke apart in, in a matter of 10 days, which is, uh, in the size, what we see there, uh, fairly dramatic, yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. All right, staying with ice, there's... We're going north. <clears throat> we're going north again. <laughs> we're going to Greenland now. And uh, staying with ice, um, who would have thought that melting ice produces heat? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and this is uh, this is actually... It was surprising. It sounds wild the, uh, to me. It's it's wild, but actually we should have thought about it because it's pure physics. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's not not really that wild. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm surprised really that it surprises. Wild, but but, <laughs> they, well, but they, they found it. They, they, yes. they, they make headlines. British Antarctic <laughs> Survey says, heat source melting Greenland ice sheet discovered. Sounds exactly. like so, sounds yeah. like there's a volcano in there or something. That's exactly. That's yeah. the, the, the wording very, of the headline. That's very <laughs> uh, interesting. Sounds pretty, pretty <laughs> dramatic. I mean, so how dramatic is office. it? What's happening? What's happening? The thing that's happening is that uh, um, the uh, Greenland ice sheet is melting uh, faster than people had uh, that, that some calculations and uh, and one of the contribution to this high melting so the one of the sources of heat uh, that is mentioned here is the uh, heat produced by the uh, kinetic energy that of the water that is seeping through the cracks in the ice uh, cap so the greenland ice cap has cracks the water can descend for thousands of meters literally down to the bottom and when it goes down 
the speed and the and the uh, the gravity is actually uh, releasing then the energy at the bottom and increasing by fractions of a degree up to a degree uh, the um, the uh, temperature of the water that is reaching the bottom and therefore increasing the heat that is melting okay so the ice at the bottom of the ice cap and so that is kinetic energy to, of the water being converted yeah. to to temperature to heat yes exactly so and it's basically is, um, a positive feedback loop and what's what was surprising there is scientists never really thought about that in the first place because there was not such a huge area covered um, that actually melted on the uh, Greenland ice sheet. And now we enter a period where during uh, the Arctic summer, literally the entire Greenland ice sheet uh, has a surface melt and that creates a lot of water that needs to go somewhere. So it is creating uh, moulins, it goes through crevasses, goes into the ice sheet and uh, goes all the way down to the bottom. And we have the water which already is warmer than the ice sheet, so it creates a huge area which it attacks but at the same time the kinetic energy here that has been um not really looked after and that's that's a new um yeah, uh, finding here why yeah, am i not in... why am i not surprised that <laughs> exactly i mean it's, it's it sounds like okay we have feedback mm. loops everywhere and now there's a new one an additional one that people haven't really thought about until now which exhilarates and that's that's it that's the interesting thing right that's that's a thing on on feedback loops so you'll have one factor that changes the equation but it adds new variables to the equation and that actually exhilarates even even more so it's even faster it's yeah. very similar to what we just talked about about the um breakup of the embayment in larsen b in antarctica where you have a number of factors coming together, exhilarating, and now we have a very similar finding um, in uh, in Greenland, where there is a, an effect happening, which is also happening in the Western Arctic ice sheet. By the way, yeah, right, and and this is this is uh, fantastic. It's a West, uh, it's in West Greenland, is a store uh, bre, uh, like the big glacier, in the uh, like just about in the middle of Greenland by Disco Bay, and interesting enough, we are talking about. BMR, which is basal melt rates. And for me, BMR is also basal metabolic rate, which is very important. <laughs> a very important... Yeah, but it is Acronym actually the metabolic... Pollution. <laughs> it's, a, it's a metabolic rate of the ice for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually very important. And it's uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it's uh, a very interesting paper. Yeah. Okay. Let us stay with weird headlines that in <laughs> that, that that make you think of weird things. So we had the big heat source in, in Greenland, <laughs> and now we have the blue blob near Iceland, which sounds like an I don't know an un underwater and a sea creature that was found. The blue blob, or maybe a superhero yep. or something. Um, <laughs> and the fizz.org titles blue blob near Iceland could slow mm. glacial melting so we have uh, a yeah. blue blob for to the rescue pretty much yeah. what is the what is <laughs> that the, blue blob well, the, the blue blob is an area of uh, uh, particularly cold water that has uh, uh, been present in the north atlantic close to iceland since 2011 oh it's and not new okay. it has uh, it's, it's not new, but it does actually have a, uh, a prolonged effect because at the beginning it was thought to be something seasonal and, and now it's kept on since 2011 and it has uh, uh, had already an influence uh, on the um, melting of the Icelandic glaciers so that are actually being kept cool by this, uh, this uh, cooler water mass. That is uh, yeah, actually about 1.4 degrees Celsius colder than what the normal should be. So, so this is uh, this is something interesting that might uh, save for a few more years the uh, or slow down in any case the uh, the melting of the Icelandic glaciers. All right. So mm -hmm. the blue blob. Um, <clears throat> let's let's follow up on something that uh, Mario, you and I talked about recently in an episode. Mm -hmm. And that was about women in science and in exploring. Um, and the fact that women often don't really get uh, become as visible as they should with what they do. And uh, mm. there's a tweet I just uh, recently came across. And it's about 
the female pilot, uh, the Argentine, and the Brazilian female pilot, Anesia Pinheiro Machado, um, who in January 1958 became the first Brazilian to reach Antarctica. And guess yep. what? That was overshadowed by um, <laughs> a male pilot who arrived in Antarctica months later. So... Um, I just think it is only fair to acknowledge her contributions. Uh, unfortunately, she's not alive anymore. She um, here's a photo from of her from back then. Uh, she was born in 1902. She lived until 1999, and <clears throat> she has an interesting history. I mean, she was the first female pilot in Brazil to carry passengers, to become a journalist. Uh, writing exclusively on matters of aviation, she made stunt flights. Uh, she did cross cross country flights, and uh, she got a even an um, in in 1943 she got an American commercial pilot's license and had additional ratings as an instructor. So so she she was a flying instructor, and then um, she was um, she was quite a quite quite an important figure, and her contribution to uh, flying to the Antarctic was just. Not really honored. So, yeah, and not and not only that. As you mentioned, she did all sorts of other things, and uh, and yeah. it's uh, it was a school of spirit of the time. But that's no excuse, and it's actually very sad that uh, that she didn't receive the uh, the acknowledgments that uh, any man uh, would have would have had in a similar situation. Right. So, Anesia Pinheiro is not Chado. And it's nothing that just um, is far, far uh, in the past. It just still is when you when you look up the uh, Google results for that. It still is uh, referenced that oh, the history first Brazilian is written. history is, is written. Still yes, Duval uh, Borges, which is uh, not the not the truth. So yeah. there, there still needs a lot um, work to be done to not only acknowledge that, but also to rewrite history to. Um, get the true facts through. It is exactly. easy to plant ideas in people's heads. It's really difficult yeah. to then correct those if they're wrong. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go on yes. to one of the craziest stories of Antarctic exploration. And uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about yeah. Shackleton and his endurance. Because if you <laughs> look into the, into the history of that whole story... Um, it is a story of, it's a miracle that they all survived, that they all came back. Mm. Not a single person died because they spent years down there after their ship sank and uh, tried to, in really adventurous fashions, tried to get help. And it, it look it up. It's it's an amazing story. And uh, here on, on Curiously Polar, we've been following the effort to find the endurance the sunken ship um over months we've we came up here over and over again and just recently there's another expedition out there and it turns out that just a few oops mario's gone um <laughs> <laughs> Here we are again. Uh, so the endurance has been found. Uh, they have, I think, just a few days before the end of the expedition, uh, they finally uh, got not not located just not the wreck. They located it, but not just in a in a in a like here we have some echolocation. No, they have actual footage of it. They have actual photos, high definition. They were very video well prepared. It. Yes, this is okay. So the BBC writes about yeah. it. Um, we are talking about three kilometers yeah. of water. Yeah, it's down. a big pressure down it there. It is it's very deep. Amazing. Down. Yes. So the the yeah. the, the expedition um, f actually found it where they thought it would be, and they sent down their underwater drone. And uh, here's uh, pictures. Let's actually look at the endurance twenty two dot org website the yes. conditions um, are just amazing when you see it's, the, it's like the you. shape of the ship it's it's, it's still it's intact. like it sank yeah, last it it sank last week exactly apart from a few uh, a few crabs and things that are crawling on it it's see, the bbc uh, it's has the remarkable BBC, conditions. the bbc has here's the drone on the bbc website mm -hmm. um yeah. and uh here is yeah the the ship itself you have photos of the original building is that shackleton yeah yes it is yep 
And it uh, was actually found on the 100th anniversary of Shackleton's funeral. Oh, no. Yes. It is <laughs> amazing <laughs> it as is. well. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm, I, was, I'm, I was blown away by that feat of of uh, exploring and of uh, mm -hmm. research and so on. And, uh, and there's, a, again, a lot of factors that come, come together here. When you see the complexity of the Weddell Sea, of the Weddell Gyre, of the big ocean current within the Weddell Sea, when you see the ice drift there, um, how the ship itself behaves when it sinks, and all of that together, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack and that they manage to really pinpoint that down and find the ship. And not only finding it, but also delivering then this high quality uh, footage of that vessel itself is just mm. amazing. It, it, they, they wrote somewhere that the, the, the water down there is, is almost like distilled. It's very, very clear. And uh, so they yeah. had, had exactly. a, a very good yeah. visibility. And then there mm. were like no wood eating microbes down there. So this it is like so ideal unreal. conditions. It looks mm. too too good to be true. It's really it's just mm. uh, when I look at those pictures, I was just so baffled. And the ship will stay and down the, there, right? It's, it's, yes. There's there's no protected. way to get yeah. it back on. No, it's it's protected by the Antarctic Treaty. Yes, so there's no and way to to heave you it. You can't even touch and, it. And you one can just thing, look, right? Yes, exactly. One thing that we discussed uh, last time it was about uh, the location of the wreck and and uh, Worsley's uh, actual position that he had taken, the errors that have been uh, uh, calculated because of the um, errors in the ephemerides that he was using, and. Uh, and it's amazing that the, it, this wreck was only about four miles south of the position that was yeah. recorded by Worsley, which is just uh, fantastic. I mean, and uh, and it's like if you want to find the needle in high stack, I would definitely call the <laughs> I would definitely call these guys because they are so amazingly good and and lucky as well, but uh, so amazingly good to uh, to find these. Uh, it's not only luck, it's also they, they were incredibly well prepared. They mm. they were actually also b um, building up on the Alfred Wagner Institute on, on charting uh, there, on uh, forecasts for uh, ocean currents and so on. So it's it's really someone thought things through there. I, mm. I, I don't want to uh, undiminish any efforts uh, done before in, oh. in that regard, but they really nailed it down and they took into consideration so many uh, thoughts about what could have happened, what could have mm. done wrong, and they were successful. It's just really something yeah. uh, it's incredible. And my news feed was full of that for, for days, or still is of full of it. It's just, everyone is just super excited yeah, in, yeah. The, in the polar community about that find. And they do, uh, they do. Uh, we have uh, on the Endurance 22 uh, website, we have uh, uh, Donald Lamont, which is, uh, who is the chairman of the Falcons uh, Maritime Heritage Trust, that says that, uh, I mean, the... Uh, outstanding master and crew and uh, the expedition team were essential but also dependent uh, they were dependent on uh, the uk uh, help from the uk south africa germany france the united states and elsewhere and so there is it's a it's an incredible feat of finding yeah. such a such a wreck uh, in in these conditions because there were like uh, as we were following through with the uh, with the Curiosity Polar, we uh, mentioned that they had been taken into the ice and the ice was moving the agulhas too. Uh, there were temperatures minus 20 and yeah. <laughs> making it very, very complex and very up, difficult just, to yeah. operate in these conditions. Yeah. But that's also the interesting thing, right? When, when we are traveling down to Antarctica, uh, we, we, we only can do that because of all those early explorers. And when we have a bad day with strong winds and overcast sky and uh, a snowstorm blizzard coming it's up. nothing. And we feel so <laughs> miserable. And then you think about Worsley's and, and Shackleton's men um, being stranded on Elephant Island and that tiny strip. And if you ever landed there and you really see how small that pitch of land is where they <laughs> actually lasted for, uh, I think, almost half a year, that was just yeah. incredible. I don't want to stay overnight there. Not even yeah. thinking about six months. <laughs> And and not only, but uh, like if without you think beginning about to that, eat when, each other, yeah. you know that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. oh. They had enough penguins. <laughs> yeah. No, but if you if you look at if you look at the site there, and uh, when I when I was there last, I was reflecting on the fact that uh, 
it's even smaller than one thinks of uh, can think of because you have this long spit of line with some rocks and it's actually on the rocks that are further north that is where they was they was located and it's very low it's very close to the sea surface but on high tide sure. there is not many rocks left so that's really there is very little and oh my gosh yeah so and and then yeah Anyways, but you had uh, you had actually found a very oh, yeah. nice podcast. Here we go. You? This yeah. this is the this is the cherry <laughs> this is the cherry on top here because um, of course you can read about these things, you can listen to us talk about these things, and uh, that is fun and all. But there is a guy called uh, Dan Snow, and he has a podcast called Dan Snow's History Hit, and uh, he was on board the Endurance Twenty Two. And he recorded a documentary about this whole expedition. And it, it, in addition to, I think, I think you can you can go and buy the documentary. And it's, mm. it's uh, I haven't I haven't watched it, but he also recorded a podcast, a behind the scenes podcast, Endurance Twenty Two Discovery: The Behind the Scenes Story is the title, um, and it's for free. And there is one episode which is, uh, I think, forty minutes long, where you are on board through him on board the Endurance 22 at the very moment when they find the Endurance shipwreck and uh, he asks people and catches the atmosphere and it is um, it is amazing because it, he takes you right there with the scientists, with the explorers and uh, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's I, I listen to that from beginning to end glued to my headphones and it um, it's cool. It's very, very cool. Yeah. Really cool. Once more, very, very well prepared expedition yes. with really everything in place to make that um, experienceable for everyone who's not anywhere near the location. And, That's and really, really awesome. Exactly. And podcast uh, podcasting is a wonderful way to experience things and a wonderful way to document things. So that's why we are doing podcast here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I, I want to mention that uh, the Dan Snow was uh, as, uh, was sending, um, especially to uh, Stephen Scott Fawcett of the Facebook group uh, Sir Ernest H. Shackleton Appreciation oh. Society, uh, excerpts and, and updates uh, through WhatsApp, actually, that um, that uh, Stephen uh, actually posted. On so that the, was a live uh, feed from the ship. So much. it was it was almost live, like wow. near real time uh, live feed while things were going on and it's uh, it's just fantastic and for anybody that uh, that likes the story of Shackleton um, this uh, particular group on uh, on on Facebook the Sir Ernest H Shackleton Appreciation Society is uh, is a is a fantastic group to to join I just want to mention that the H uh, stands for Henry very important of course <laughs> 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 All right. Um, I guess that brings us to the end of this episode um, of Curiously Polar. The three are back together. We, we're bringing the band back together. Um, <laughs> this is this is awesome. And uh, yeah, so I guess there will be many more things to talk about in the coming weeks. Um, of course, we are online at curiouslypolar.com or on the Twitters at Curiously Polar. So if you want to get in touch. That's where we would do it. We'll be back soon. Take care and bye-bye. Take care.